Well, there was never any doubt in my mind that one day I would leave Goldman Sachs and focus on Africa.com. It was really for me just a question of timing. And at the beginning of 2010, all of the different pieces of the puzzle really seemed to come together. Uh, we knew that the World Cup was taking place that year in South Africa. All of the economic reports continue to show the development and growth in Africa. Uh, Goldman Sachs had just produced um, a year or so before the next 11, showing that Nigeria would be one of the next 11 countries beyond Brazil, Russia, India, and China that whose economies would surpass that of the United States by the year 2050. So there's a tremendous amount of understanding um, at the time that I made the decision that there's great growth potential in Africa. So it wasn't um, as hard of a decision as one might have thought. So with Africa.com, you're using technology to change perceptions and images of Africa. Mm. How are you doing that? Well, we're really doing that simply by showing the truth. I think that over time, most images of Africa have been very stereotyped. Poverty, war, famine, disease. And so by focusing on all that really exists in Africa, showing the beauty of the culture, showing the beauty of arts, showing the travel opportunities, getting to know the people, the music. We produced, for example, the first comprehensive guide to museums in Africa. And so one can come to Africa.com and find museums in all 53 countries on the continent. And so that helps to change the perceptions that this is a land of just animals, but a place of very significant people with a long and rich history. Right, it sounds quite uh, comprehensive and even to an extent philosophical. How much of the work that you do is geared towards helping investors understand the business climate? As you're saying, we've got emerging and frontier markets in Nigeria, which could be one of the next 11 emerging markets to watch. How do they use that information to gauge whether or not they should be going to Asia or coming to Africa? Yes, well, to be very honest with you, when we launched Africa.com, Focusing on the investment opportunities was not on our radar screen, but we've done surveys of our users and we have found that among the top three reasons they come to our site is to learn about investment opportunity in Africa. So we are right now just figuring out what our strategies are to satisfy that demand because there is so much interest, particularly coming from the U.S. side. Um, I think we sort of point to the third week of September in 2010 as a moment that the U.S. markets woke up to the investment opportunities in Africa. Clearly the Europeans and the Asians have known of it for a long time, but really only when you had a significant number of American corporations announce how significant Africa is to their global operations did Africa really make the radar screen of the Fortune 500 in the US. I want you to revert back to your days as a banker proper and help me quantify or understand how people quantify and price African risk. I mean, obviously, we've moved past the image of Africa as a place of war and degradation and disease, but we're still a continent emerging from that history of squalor with a lot of shortcomings. Um, when you speak to people, when uh, people engage you on Africa.com, how do they see this, this revival in Africa with the, f you know, the reality of the pervasive risks? Yes, and I, and I think that it really, you ask such an important question because the challenge is for investors to understand what the real risk is versus a perceived risk. And that's where the financial opportunity lies in that arbitrage between what's perceived and what is real. And there is a big difference between those two. And so I think, for example, with the world being able to see the World Cup and see how operationally South Africa could pull something of that magnitude off, that helps people recognize that the operational risk may not be as great as they perceived it to have been. Limitations, obviously, as I've alluded to, infrastructure, the issues around social inequality despite growth, the poor remain poor, there's a skills deficit which makes the cost of doing business a lot higher. How can we get around that? Well, I think that that's always been one of the big constraints for investors has been the fact that there has been this skills gap. And one of the exciting things that has been changing over the last many years has been the repa repatriation, first of all. You have so many Africans who would have loved to have lived at home, but didn't have economic opportunity at home. And so you go to Washington, D.C., and you have a cab driver who was a chemical engineer from Sierra Leone. But because there was no opportunity there, he's driving cabs in D.C. So I think one big difference in terms of the skills gap today versus five, ten years ago is that you have a number of very well-educated Africans who are going back home to use those skills. 
I think a second piece of it are a number of the very important efforts in the education space to improve the skills. And so one example is the Student Sponsorship Program of South Africa, something I'm kind of proud of. Um, I co-founded it with a gentleman by the name of Niagaka Ungari, and we are celebrating our 10th anniversary um, right now. Tell us a little bit more about uh, the Student Sponsorship Program and the Student <coughs> Support Initiative. I mean, w obviously your passion for Africa, you need to see young Africans empowered is what motivates you. But what keeps it going? It's that same passion is what keeps it going. I think that the students in the program are people who have tremendous capability and all they needed was opportunity. And that's what the Student Sponsorship Program provides, is an opportunity for them to receive the very best education that South Africa has to offer. How does it work effectively? Because I know that you identify talented youth in the so-called disadvantaged communities of the country and you send them to private school. Yes. We are essentially sort of a middleman among three important um, groups that all start with the letter S, students, schools, and sponsors. And so we're at the hub of that. So with the students, we go out into the townships. We have very deep community outreach to find very smart students. Um, yeah, the demand for what we do is tremendous. And when you look at the pool of talent that we consider before accepting them into the program, in a given year, we may take 50 or 60 students out of 3,000 applicants. And so the students that we find are those diamonds in the rough with just tremendous potential. Then we match them with the top schools in South Africa. They have to be able to get into those schools on their own merit. Be um, being selected by SSP isn't sufficient. They have to get in on their own. But the kids that we choose are all quite capable of doing that. And then we find sponsors who agree to mentor the students for their five years in high school and agree to pay and fund the child's school fees. I think you're actually bridging a much bigger gap than, than you've actually alluded to, to the extent that the President of South Africa has just delivered his State of the Nation address. And from that address came the three T's, time, teachers, and just basic commitment within the education system. And one of the biggest um, deficiencies we've had in South Africa is corporate sponsorship of education. It's one of those social goods that are seen to be the responsibility of the state, which rightfully uh, ought to be the case. But given the, the, the skills deficit that we're seeing, we need a little bit more corporate intervention. Yes. Why not? Why are we not seeing enough, do you think? I think that it may have something to do with the history of the country. I think we modeled our program after a similar one in the US. And I think that a lot of the, this sort of work in South Africa happens on a very personal level. You might have a wealthy person who lives in Santon, who has a maid, whose child lives with them, and they end up paying that child's school fees. And so they feel as if they've already sort of, you know, instead of saying, I gave it the office, you know, they sort of say, I gave it home. And so I think that's one of the challenges for corporations. I think because there's also such tremendous social needs on many fronts in South Africa that the corporations feel as if they're targeted for every problem. Um, but I think that education is just key because once you provide that sort of a support, it allows people to empower themselves to solve all the other problems. Success rates. And here I'm talking about uh, producing students who are well suited for the economy of South Africa because that's also where we're having a problem. We're producing matriculants each year but many of them cannot be absorbed productively into the economy, either because they've studied the wrong things or they just don't have the aptitude for an economy that's focused on industrialized growth, so they don't have the engineering, the science, the technological skills. Um, how do you help? Yeah, and I think there's another um, thing on that list that I would also mention, and that is the social skills, which are very important. Um, and so what our, our students have a tremendous success rate. We, of those students, that we take in, and I'm applying this across the 600 students that we've had in the first decade of our existence. Across those 600, over 90% of those who start with us finish with us. And of those who finish and matriculate, over, uh, close to 100% get a university exemption and go on to university. There's a very heavy emphasis on maths and science in our, in our program. And again, I think another very important piece of it is leadership and developing the skills associated with knowing how to work with those in leadership positions. And so by going to the sorts of schools in our program, the St. John's, the St. Mary's, the Rodin's, they develop a certain understanding of the softer skills 
that help them to be accepted by the leadership class in the private sector. All right, there's been 10 years of uh, SSP. Obviously, you're hoping for another 10, even 20, 30, 50 years. What's needed to make it a, a thriving program beyond what it already is? I think we just need more of what we're doing. We need more resources. Um, we've been very fortunate in our first 10 years to have a number of um, firms in the financial services sector support us along with many of the top foundations in South Africa. Um, but we always need good mentors to help guide our students so we're always recruiting for mentors we're always looking for people to sponsor more students we have more great students than we can fund and we're looking to build an endowment and so we've been involved actually in several BEE transactions as a charitable partner and so for those persons doing BEE deals and looking for a, an equity partner that will be able to benefit the broader population that's another place where we're happy to play a role